Okay, thank you. I guess I'll uh, I'll start by saying uh, I'm Chris Lukasik. I'm an associate professor of English and American Studies at Purdue University, and uh, this year I'm also a faculty fellow in the College of Technology. Um, and I say this not so much to uh, as an invitation for further conversations beyond this session because we're at Purdue, uh, the College of Technology is trying to reimagine their undergraduate curriculum. And one of the things that they're hearing from industry and from students is that um, they want more liberal arts, believe it or not. Um, so the kind of skill sets that we in the traditional, although I kind of bristle at that remark, uh, liberal, uh, liberal arts education deliver actually is, we're trying to have it be 50-50 if not greater, and the uh, new undergraduate curriculum we're designing uh, for an initial cohort of about 50 freshmen in, uh, we hope, fall of 2014. So these ideas about the digital humanities perhaps being one way in which culture might be integrated with technology, particularly with culture maybe being the driver, as opposed to technology always driving culture, uh, I, I um, come track me down. I'd like to have a conversation about it. If your institution's already doing this, or they have um, programs or centers that are doing this, I'm very interested in learning about them. Um, what I'm going to talk about today is my uh, experiences using digital periodical databases uh, while conducting research for my new book project, The Image in the Text, um, Intermediality Illustration in Nineteenth Century American Literature. Uh, and this project examines the explosive growth of illustration within American literary culture from 1825 to 1875. Um, but the more I think about it, the project is really about the relationship between culture and technology during the nineteenth century, or at least one particular form of it. And what I think the book is going to try to do, if it can pull it off, is resist some of the techno-determinism that uh, sort of shapes that relationship. So what I'm going to try to prove in the book is the ways in which culture actually facilitates the introduction of new uh, technologies, preventing some, restricting others, facilitating um, um, different kinds of image technologies over the course of the 19th century. Um, but I won't be talking about that today. Uh, I'll be just talking about very briefly sort of methodological problems I've been running into uh, when working with these digital databases. And uh, one of the questions that uh, I've been thinking about is whether there might be a textual bias, uh, or perhaps, uh, to put it another way, perhaps more precisely, a certain optical conception of the image that shapes how literary studies conceives of images and their relationships to new media and media studies. And if this is true, if you're buying what I'm selling there, um, to what extent does this conception actually inform our notions of the digital archive? Um, but given the roundtable format topic and as well as my uh, project's nascent state, I'll refrain from speaking directly about my project's argument and shape, although I'd be happy to elaborate on those points later. Instead, I'm going to try to identify some of the challenges that the digital periodical archive presents for the historian of illustration. And I'm going to limit my remarks to the two digital resources I know best, the American Periodical Series, or APS, and the Catalog of American Engravings at the American Antiquarian Society, or CAPE. The APS contains over 1,200 American magazines and journals that began publishing between 1740 and 1900 while the CAPE catalogs over 1,600 engravings that were issued as separate publications or as illustrations in books and periodicals in America from the early 18th century to the year 1820. For the sake of soliciting conversation, I've organized my remarks uh, around two broad and basic sets of questions which arose for me while conducting my research. These questions are by no means exclusive to the domain of periodical illustration but their answers quickly become problematic when working with digital periodical databases. These are what counts as an illustration and what does the illustration illustrate. This second question I find particularly provocative because it foregrounds two issues that inform any approach to working with illustration. First, the question of what images say and what they can say. And second, how do we know what images say? 
What does, for example, this illustration of Amelia say? I find these questions fascinating for illustration since what the image says and can say often depends upon and is uh, frequently reduced to the words that accompany it. Yet rather than restrict the image to a mere visualization of those words to the left, we should ask what does the media combination of image and text show and what does it hide? This is an intermedial approach to the image text relationship, which is going to be sort of the main method of my book. Um, but again, I, dig I digress. Um, my first question, what counts as an illustration? Uh, this immediately emerges when you use digital periodical databases. Do diagrams such as these count? Do printer's emblems, billheads, book plates, maps, or plans? I've found wide variations from database to database. The APS includes most of these as illustrations, whereas the CAPE, off, uh, excuse me, the CAPE excludes them from the start. If you run a document type search um, in the APS for illustration, image slash photograph, and editorial cartoon for the years running from 1740 to 1820, here's what you'll find. The blue line represents the total number of hits, and you'll notice a dramatic increase in the first two decades of the 19th century. Yet, if you dig into those numbers and actually look at and verify the images represented by the APS data, you discover that these two images count as matches for the document type illustration. In fact, all 12 APS hits for illustration in the year 1802 turn out to be musical scores, which presents another kind of question that is, is a musical score an illustration of a song, perhaps? Um, but again, I, dig I digress. Um, I found that the problem of false matches is significant for the APS. When you remove musical scores and other false matches from the same APS document type search for illustration, image slash photograph and editorial cartoon, this is what you find. The red line represents the true total number of hits that are actually illustrations. The actual number, however, becomes somewhat larger when working with the CAPE catalog. The yellow line represents the total number of periodical engravings generated by a genre keyword search. Since the CAPE catalog is more sensitive than the APS to the kinds of images that might count as illustrations, and the CAPE catalog also counts multiple images that may appear on the same periodical page as separate images, which is a big difference between the two, I find this trend line to be more accurate. Now, besides the problem of finding what you're not looking for, historians of periodical illustration working with digital databases also run the risk of not finding what's not there. This problem is referred to as detached plates or detached leaves which are illustrations that were originally part of a periodical but have been removed from their original publication context. Here you see an array of detached plates from the same 19th century scrapbook depicted in the last slide. The scrapbook, which is at the Library Company of Philadelphia, was made by Mrs. H. Godley, contains dozens of detached plates from early American gift books and periodicals such as the Columbian Magazine and Godey's Ladies Book. I'll leave Mrs. Godley's Sinophilia for you to discuss. My last question, what does the illustration illustrate, pertains to how we go about identifying and cataloging what is being depicted. An image is worth a thousand words, they say, but which ones, for example, should be the keywords or tags for this illustration from the Massachusetts Magazine? Even less iconographically dense illustrations, such as the 1788 silhouette of George Washington and Benjamin Franklin, can be problematic. Should this illustration be tagged as founders, president, profile, silhouette, physiognomy, portrait, lavater, character, or post-revolutionary staring contest? All this leads me to wonder whether there might be an asymmetry in how images and words operate with respect to digitization and data visualization. In short, how do we visualize the visual? Can the density of an image's information be usefully turned into data? I don't have an answer, nor the time for a conclusion, but if nothing else, I hope my remarks, as well as my larger pro project, prompt us to reconsider how we think about images and their relationship to text, and in doing so, get us to reassess the ways in which we study 19th century American literature in particular, and early American print culture in general. 
It's a provocation that I find all the more urgent given the current debates within the field concerning the relationship between literary and media studies, as well as the ubiquity of the image in our culture today. Thank you. Um, <clears throat> so I'm uh, Krista Vigilius, um, and I'm a clear postdoc at the University of Alabama. Um, and the title of my talk, which I don't have a slideshow for, but I think the title on some of your schedules might still be to be determined, but it's actually, it's, it's actually more than marketing, digital exhibitions as public scholarship. Um, so uh, I'm going to keep my remarks pretty brief, but I can say more in the Q&A or in the, in the roundtable later. Um, so um, at Alabama, I'm working at the um, A.S. Williams Collection of Americana, um, and I'm curating digital exhibits for 19th and 20th century photographs. Um, so in this roundtable, I kind of want to talk a little bit about the, some of the projects I'm currently working on. Um, and some of the conclusions that I've come to about digital exhibition of archival objects. Um, so my main point is basically that digital exhibits have a real potential as a form of public scholarship um, that both archivists and academics can benefit from. And, and just as an aside, I want to say that my background is in 19th century American literature and visual culture. Um, and I can, uh, I came to my current position as someone who had a background, a research background in, you know, the material of the collection that I'm working in, but I had actually never used digital exhibits, and I had definitely never made digital exhibits, and I, you know, had, had, to, had to sort of deal with that. Um, and um, I immediately came to the collection and had, you know, three different research projects that I wanted to start. But with digital exhibits, I really wanted to make something that was actually useful and that I would want to use myself. Um, and I think there is sort of prejudice sometimes about digital exhibits um, in uh, library collections as uh, sort of, uh, you know, minimally useful decorative appendages sort of to actual digital collections. You know, there are links that you go to from a, from a bigger digital collection um, and they sort of showcase some of the items in the collection and therefore show and they're to promote, promote the collection from the side of the archivists. Um, and I wanted to make them something that was really uh, useful. Um, and um, if you're just doing description of items and doing detailed metadata, at this point, uh, digital repositories can do that. Um, and digital repositories do that um, to a greater or lesser degree. Um, and so I think the thing that digital exhibits can offer that is sort of truly unique um, is this potential for collaborative scholarship um, and for community outreach. Um, and you're never going to see that in a finding aid and you're not going to see that in um, an ordinary digital repository. Um, so the first few projects that I've gotten to work on at Alabama have sort of given me a sense of what really simple, technically straightforward digital exhibits uh, can offer. Um, so exhibits can, I think, sort of go beyond a simple promotional relationship toward an archive. Um, you know, here's the stuff we have, you should come and visit us and actually use it. Um, so they can be, go beyond that sort of promotional uh, relationship and become archives of their own, um, sort of repositories for living history um, and help bring, you know, that can both help bring attention to a collection and also function as a form of freestanding scholarship. Um, so the project that I'm going to talk about here is a digital exhibit for two photograph albums kept by teachers at the Lincoln Normal School in uh, Marion, Alabama. Uh, from approximately 1909 to 1924. So the Lincoln Normal School was one of the early common schools um, that was established in the South for the education of freed slaves after the Civil War. Um, it was operational from about 1868 to 1970. Um, and as the title Normal School sort of implies, it functioned to educate teachers um, and also functioned as a general primary and secondary educational education for several generations of African Americans in the South. Um, it became, in one form, it, an offshoot of Lincoln Normal became Alabama State University, 
the first historically black uh, uh, public college in, in, the, in the United States. Um, and sort of a lot of famous visitors and uh, people in the civil rights movement came through at various periods in the 20th century. Um, so we've just completed the digitization of these two albums as of yesterday, <laughs> actually. So they are, are currently online. Um, so hopefully you can find them on the library website. Uh, digital archive. So there are two scrapbooks. This is the first earlier scrapbook and this, or photo albums rather, photo albums with detailed captions. Uh, and this is the second one. Um, they are, let's see, I can look at some of the images. I think the second one is, the second one is kind of the more interesting one. And I'll just go through some pictures kind of randomly. Um, they are, There's some teachers from the school. So, par so part of the reason that we're excited about this as a candidate for a digital exhibit is because there are a lot of images, formal pictures like this one, of teachers at the school that we don't have really records of other places. Also pictures of the buildings, which were all demolished in 1970 under <laughs> sort of uh, controversial circumstances. Um, so we have visual documentation of that. Um, we have very informal pictures of students and student performances um, that, as far as I can tell, you don't see a lot of other places. Um, and um, uh, to, 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 from the perspective of a digital exhibit, it's also an exciting collection just because um, there are other materials that we can tie in sort of from uh, other historically black colleges in Alabama. Photo, we have several photo collections that sort of tie in uh, with this. So I'm not going to go through all of these. It kind of takes a, time, it takes a while to, uh, to actually, uh, you know, zoom in and get some good pictures. But um, this, was a, this was a building that was built during the, the second photo album, actually. So that's, we have a record of the actual construction of this building and a record of the dedication. Um, so anyway, I'll, I'll let you look at that if you're, if you're interested. Um, but, uh, so we're excited about these because there are limited archival resources basically on the Lincoln Normal School. Um, and, uh, you know, we get a lot of different kinds of images here. Um, the digital exhibit that we're pulling from this repository is very much still in progress, so I don't have any images to uh, show of the actual exhibit. Um, but uh, we're basically pulling a selection of these images from Acumen, which is um, Alabama's uh, sort of home-built home -built digital repository. Um, and we are uh, importing them into an Emeka site um, which for those of you who don't know is sort of a free open access uh, software from the Center for New Media um, that allows the exhibi exhibition of archival objects. Um, and um, plans for the site are sort of uh, diverse. We're, we're doing a neat line map um, of the campus buildings like this one, sort of with pop-up images. So one, one goal is to have a map where you can see sort of where the different buildings are located across time and to have the actual images of the buildings appear on the map. Um, and sort of traditional thematic captions to go with the images uh, for the exhibit. But what I'm going to talk about mainly is about the community outreach component components of the exhibition that we're working on right now. Um, so in some ways the plans for this exhibition <coughs> have been collaborative since it began. Um, we decided to digitize this album as quickly as we did, um, mainly because we were contacted by a trustee of the Lincolnite Club in Marion, Alabama. Um, so the Lincolnite Club is the main alumni association uh, for the school. And she'd heard we had these albums and was interested in sharing copies of them with other alumni and the Lincoln Normal School Museum. Um, and so in the process of filling her request, 
you know, I, I spent some time going through these images and I really wanted to do more than just a basic finding aid and some, uh, and some images with pretty limited metadata, which was the original plan. Um, and so um, I started working on a history of the school and the curriculum um, to include as captions for, for the Omeka site. Um, and I sent them to this woman <laughs> the, uh, uh, at the Lincolnite Club, uh, along with a series of questions that I had and wasn't finding answered in the current scholarship on the Lincoln Normal School, which is relatively limited. Um, so I wanted to know more about details about the curriculum um, and school performances, as well as background on the teachers and students at the school. And these were all questions that were actually prompted by some of the photos in the album that I was seeing of, you know, these crazy performances of, you know, the Fairy Queen or, um, uh, you know, these these very uh, uh, and these picnics with <laughs> with the teachers in, in the grounds around the school. Uh, my hope is that they'll be able to identify and provide histories for some of the students and teachers in the album, um, and supplement some of the relatively sparse sources that we have for Lincoln Normal. Um, and there are several different directions the project could take, and it depends really mainly on the time of uh, an interest of members of the community and the Alumni Association. So on the more extensive side, um, I could imagine an, an exhibit that provides not only detailed metadata for the images, which Acumen at this point provides relatively minimal metadata for the images, so detailed metadata and a general background on the prominent figures, um, plus sort of oral histories is, it w would, be, would be my sort of pie in the sky uh, uh, goal for this project. Um, Oral histories showcasing audio interviews with members of the Alumni Association that provided a record of their memories of the school um, in relation to the images that we have. Um, uh, some possible ideas are to have audio clips from alumni accompanying particular images that they discuss or to use alumni materials and yearbooks to supplement what we know about the curriculum at, at Lincoln Normal. Um, and in addition to these alumni contacts, we've begun plans for a traveling exhibition, um, partnering with a local middle school in Tuscaloosa, Alabama, to bring a physical version of the exhibit to them in February. Um, so at some point, I could envision also sort of bringing in student responses to that physical exhibit into the digital exhibit um, once, it, once it goes up. Um, uh, and this is actually like I said, it's very much in progress, but this is also sort of what I found find exciting about even fairly simple uh, Omeka sites is it's sort of an archive, it can become an organic archive that um, can be launched in a pretty minimal manner and sort of grows over time depending on responses from the community and responses from uh, other people who are invested in the project for whatever reason. All right, so I want to talk about a particular sort of visualization, about data visualization. And I have sort of two main points to make, which I'll try not to make at too much length. Um, one is to ask the question of what data visualization is doing in humanities departments and digital humanities right now. Uh, and I want to present a sort of observation about that, which is that humanists don't like to display data in Cartesian space. Uh, I'll explain what I mean by that, but also I want to say they have good reasons for this, and I think they should get over those good reasons for this and try to plot things more in a world that is really actually data. And then as evidence for that, I want to talk a little bit about some work that I've done with others putting textual metadata on very large archives on the scales of hundreds of thousands or millions of texts into a form that they can be visualized dynamically in all sorts of ways. I want to start really quite far from history or literature with a particular sort of micro genre of data visualization that I've become kind of obsessed with over the last week, which is subway maps and the way that they represent the world that we live in. The thing that I have been doing uh, without initially knowing why is taking subway maps and georectifying them so that they actually conform to the contours of the cities that they are in. So georectification is a uh, process of taking a historical map and 
implanting it on a modern city. So Abby Mullen, who's a grad student in the history department here uh, and sitting right over there, has been leading a project for our department in taking old maps of Boston and putting them into their historical context. So this here is a commercial map of Boston, which you can see was originally oriented in the sort of strange north-south direction. And actually, when um, our grad student, Abigail Adgate, who was the one who actually took this map and put it into a proper form, first looked at it, could not figure out where in the world this laid on the modern terrain of Boston, because it's such a strange view that we're unaccustomed to thinking about now, that stretches from what's now downtown through the North End, which nobody thinks of as a contiguous downtown for Boston anymore, but which was at the time that this was made a really natural way to look at it. So maps like this are good for understanding these historical sources, but with the subway maps, we actually know what they are already. And what you get is something that's very different and that doesn't help you to understand the subway map better exactly. You get this sort of wild phenomenon here. And if you see every single you know, spot on the Boston subway does line up underneath with where they are. Right now, we are down here somewhere. And if we go back to the northeastern map, well, it disappeared. But it is somewhere in here right now. We're right around this sort of strange place where the yellow line and the green line, or the orange line and the green line are closer together than they say. Um, and this is interesting if and only if you have some deep, intimate knowledge of the Boston subway map, just for those of you who aren't actually from here and haven't been staring at this thing for your entire life. I do have one. Did I lose it? Yeah, the New York City subway map here, which is a much more correct map, but nonetheless takes a great deal of distension. If you spend a lot of time looking at the New York City subway map, you know it doesn't look like this. So what do you learn from a data visualization like this? It's one of the questions people always ask about data visualizations. And I'm not sure from this one that you learn anything in particular other than that North is not in the direction that New Yorkers think that North is. But um, even if this doesn't show anything, I think it shows it in a really interesting way because in form, if not necessarily in spirit, it bears a really close connection to a lot of the sort of visualizations that humanists like to make. What do humanists do when they visualize data? Um, so most statistical graphics live in this really sort of artificially constructed Cartesian space where x represents one thing or y represents one thing. And I'm using Cartesian sort of very broadly here, including you know, logarithmic plots, polar plots, where it's r and theta instead of x and y. But the idea is that you take the real world and you map it onto these artificial quantities. Um, this is the world of scientific visualization to a very large degree. And it's rooted in this idea of modeling. X and Y are these abstractions that are never more than a few steps away from some particular model. Humanists don't make many graphs with Y and X axes, comparatively. Mapping uses a, or sorry, let me back up. Rather than make graphs with X and Y axes, they tend to do two things in particular. You see them doing a lot of thematic mapping, and you see them doing a lot of network representation. And I would say that basically the best and the most work that humanists are doing in data visualization are in those two fields. And you might argue that mapping is a sort of Cartesian space, but I actually think that although mathematically it is, socially it is not. Maps, latitude and longitude are not simply some abstract x and y coordinates that people work with. Latitude and longitude are not actually the point of mapping visualizations. The point of mapping visualizations is to situate events in the shared cultural space of maps, which so many people have different access to and have different interpretive slants that they can bring to a particular sort of model. Networks obviously don't use any sort of X and Y formatting at all. Instead, in a network representation, you just have positions for nodes which are positioned relative only to each other. If you look at a network graph, nobody ever says x represents height and y represents time. That is not how the sort of network maps that humanists use. And I won't take the time to prove this, but this is essentially true. If you look at the work done in digital humanities journals in the last three months, in Digital Humanities Quarterly, in uh, the DH Now website, you do get predominantly those two sorts of representations, a few bar graphs, but the bar graphs are almost never used for the purposes of uh, visual argumentation. They're usually used actually in sort of the sort of you know, 
Maddie professional development talk about where how long it takes journal to get published in different fields and that sort of stuff, which isn't related to actual humanistic research in any way. And then you get two other sorts of things, which I didn't think of beforehand. One are visualizations where color is superimposed on actual texts, which we are accustomed to working within. This is uh, Lisa Rohde's article about topic modeling and figurative language, and she's put colors that show what topics, according to some algorithmic transformation, these different words fall in. So the green corresponds to a topic about night, and the yellow corresponds to a topic about life. Um, and you get these things, word clouds, which are uh, very widespread in the humanities world, often sort of reviled in the world of actual data scientists. But in addition to the sort of, you know, pettiness of this critique here, it's an important point, spatial visualization wherein space is meaningless is the way that Drew Conway describes it. There is no actual Cartesian meaning for the ways that words are arranged in word clouds. They just simply sort of exist there. So why don't humanists like Cartesian representations? The reason, I think, has to do with a very strong suspicion of modeling. Most humanists have a really rich and multifaceted notion of the many different meanings that geographic space can have. Um, and when they look at networks, the individual nodes tend to be people or places or texts or things which in themselves are really meaningful and admit of a whole wide variety and possibility of interpretations, just like the sort of text that we look at. I think this in some ways is sort of the archetypal humanities data visualization to do as little as possible on top of the existing framework of the text and simply to superimpose your data on a scale on top of it. Um, but the other reason is that Cartesian space requires an investment in categories and models that humanists are sort of innately built to push up against. We don't like locking into the categories that data has been put into by others. Um, humanists often when they make data visualizations are strongly driven to unsettle the categories themselves. They like to try to represent um, what is the word? Uncertainty. They like to try to represent uncertainty in the models that they make rather than actually representing the data that they have. This is one chart. This is a, a project out of the University of Richmond visualizing emancipation. It's sort of universal in the world of data visualization. If you make a map and you have circles that are larger, that represents some sort of quantity on the size. This map, it's not the size that's being represented. It's the uncertainty of the area in which the emancipation events in 1864 and 1865 took place. I find it completely impossible to actually read this model, having looked at so many other thematic maps which use the sort of traditional language of thematic mapping. But I find it very interesting that this group at Richmond did both sort of break out of that traditional way of thinking about what it means to create maps and has stuck with this idea that size doesn't have to represent quantity, that size can represent the sort of fuzzy penumbra around a particular place when a documented emancipation event happened. Um, and then sort of more technically, Johanna Drucker's work has laid out a whole bunch of ways that we can sort of shatter the bounds of normal Cartesian coordinates. So here she has uh, a originally a rather simple graph of male and female populations by country complicated by having sort of strange graphical transformations that call into question the idea of gender, the idea of nationality, or the idea of quantity itself. I think these things are very sort of interesting, but I think they're, they're really problematic because they forego most possibilities for letting data inflect our appreciation and change our understanding of the categories that are plotted to begin with. So I want to go back to this subway chart for just one more second. Um, when you look at this, it's not clear which of these is the real world and which of these is the fake world. When I look at this, my actual mental map of New York much more closely resembles that one on the left there than that one on the right there. I do think that Manhattan is wider than it looks like it is on the left. I do think that Manhattan is centrally located compared to the Bronx and Brooklyn and Queens. Um, and I'm not sure that I'm wrong about that. I'm not sure that actually situating that map in the space of um, latitude and longitude successfully 
changes it into something that helps me to better understand the subway map. I think actually what's going on here is what I would sort of call a reverse cartogram. If you've ever seen a cartogram, oh no, did I lose my maps of cartograms? Oh, there they are. Um, this is a cartogram here. You've probably seen these before. This is a map of the United States distorted so that population is represented by equal area. So, you know, Alaska is reduced to this sort of completely emaciated, wrung out um, thing, and you know, Brooklyn and the Bronx and the San Francisco Bay Area are sort of returned to their rightful glory as, you know, the actual center. This doesn't work particularly well, I don't think. Cartograms are one of these graphical techniques that are not used nearly as much as they're talked about, and often projects try to take them up and they don't actually succeed. Um, and one of the reasons is that it's really very helpful to enforce the quantitative logic of Cartesian space on the geographic world. Uh, our representation of space is really sort of primary, and this doesn't map onto something that's realer, except in this one case of these subway diagrams where this is the actual physical representation of the space. So oh, I did have one other, that's fine. Um, so what I think that you can learn from looking at something like this is that this is a map which structures our particular interpretation of the world and pushing it into Cartesian space means that you take away from latitude and longitude the sort of naturalism and the shared sense of location and possibility that we usually apply to maps and change it into something that actually more closely resembles X and Y Cartesian coordinates. Here the map of New York that has been distorted is not functioning the way that most thematic mapping does where you intuitively know where Manhattan is and where Brooklyn is and you try to juxtapose it with your own life. It sort of recovered the abstraction of latitude and longitude and returned it into a space of what I would say is a sort of Cartesian coordinates. And I want to figure out how we can do things with humanities visualization that does that same thing, that unsettles our shared categorical understandings of what the world looks like, like this New York City subway map here, and places it into a space which distorts it and helps us to understand the ways in which our imaginations of the world don't necessarily map up to what it is. Um, and I won't talk particularly long about this project bookworm that I've been associated with, uh, but the idea behind it is that it is a set of databases that allow you to take extraordinary large collections of text and get access to their metadata in various different forms. Um, when I looked through those, those charts through the last issues. There were a few line graphs in there. That was one of the fuses of Cartesian space. They were almost always this product called uh, Google Ngrams, which you are probably familiar with. Um, or if you're not, it was worth sort of playing around with, which is a representation of all the books in Google's libraries situated in, um, and the word counts of different words over time, how often they take place. This, uh, Bookworm project is something that I helped develop with the um, with a couple of scientists at Harvard and uh, a number of other people whose names I should actually put up here. I have them back here: um, Neva Chernyavsky, Martin Camacho, Billy Janich, uh, and Erez Lieberman, Aiden, and JV Michelle, who are the two who worked with Google on Google Ngrams. And the idea behind this is that you can get access to arbitrary sorts of metadata that isn't just year and words. You can take any text and break it down into the library metadata catalogs that librarians have been collecting for years. And th those metadata categories are socially and intuitively the same sorts of things like that New York City subway map, the categories that we have been living in and which by distorting them to fit into Cartesian space we can start to understand new ways of looking at the world. And I am mindful that my talk is too long and aim to go over everyone else, so let me just skip ahead to the end here and talk about what it would mean to do that. So you can do some forms of mapping with this and look at how the usage of different terms changes over time. You can see how um, 
you know, the cultural geography of the United States influences the use of various different Indian tribes, which match relatively well onto the areas where the, um, the, the white uh, frontier newspapers, which are mostly included in this set, this is about six million newspaper pages from 1830 to 1922, uh, where those publications take place. Um, but you can also do things like reduce, take what we think of as a linear quantity of time and break it up and place it in Cartesian space. So here, the linear progression of the years is at the top, and then the cyclical progression of the months is on the y-axis. So this is the usage of the word bicycle in newspapers. And newspapers are important in large part because they're advertising media. And what you can see when you look at a chart like this is not just that there was a tremendous boom of bicycle production in 1895, 1896, and 1897, which is um, something that we largely know already. But you can also see the way that that inflected by seasonal patterns. And it doesn't actually start until June or July in 1895, where, although obviously nobody is buying bicycles in the winter, it starts considerably earlier, April, May, in 96 and 97, before it fades out. And that it doesn't have any sort of semblance of a return in early 1898. The bicycle boom is well over in the Christmas time of 1898, essentially. And this is the sort of insight which is very difficult to get out of a traditional search engine, but which is really important to figure out how to get out of these really large textual databases, which are coming online right now. So one last thing about how we can, and there's a, if any of you have a large textual collection and want to put it into this, this is all open source, and we're sort of looking for more large collections of text that we can work with at the moment. Uh, and there's all sorts of programmatic APIs and various other things. Um, one other thing you can do with data like this, and which I have made more hay out of than I ever thought that I would be able to, <laughs> is look at the ways that some of our imagined categories conflict with each other, the way those two subway maps conflict with each other. So I started by looking at uh, remembered histories of historical fiction and how those change with the actual ways that language changes over time. So obviously this is not a scene from Mad Men. This is one of the places that, you know, our imagination of Mad Men is set in the 60s gets sort of disrupted by the fact that they all have the same computer that I do on their set. But you can do this with all different sorts of text. So if you take The Age of Innocence, which is a historical novel, it's written in 1920 or 1921, set in the 1870s, you can see that Edith Wharton is not away, aware of the ways that language has changed in her own time. Um, she's using words like to finance, which, although it comes completely naturally to a sort of bourgeois New Yorker of 1920, like Edith Wharton, was completely absent before the Gilded Age as a metaphor for paying for. Um, and just as you can take Google Ngrams, which is this juxtaposition of um, word use in time and break it down into, um, into the much richer world of all the different categories which exist in metadata, the Library of Congress classifications, which structure our disciplines and structure the way we find things in the libraries, the geographical metadata that libraries have always collected, the information about author age and gender, which is very easy to get out of library catalogs. Um, just as you can do that with changing the Ngrams project into the Bookworm project, which I was just talking about, the other thing that you can do is not just compare ratios of language in two different time periods, but compare them across those different things. So the sort of my proposal for what it would take to take this New York City subway map and the dissembling of our understood social world and breaking it down into a Cartesian space is to take a novel like Moby Dick, obviously, um, and rearrange it in a space where, when I start this, you can see bottom to top will represent the least common words in the language, the most common words. And a novel like this occupies a problem or an interesting space between literary genres. So on the left are going to be the words that are characteristic of uh, 
PS uh, in the Library of Congress classification, so American fiction. Um, unless I've got that wrong, and PR is American fiction. Somebody will yeah. correct me. PR is? PS. It is PS. Okay, good. Um, and G, which is geography, which are the sort of two areas. So we can take, you know, Moby Dick and break it down. And when we do that, it partly helps us to understand Moby Dick, but it also helps us to get greater insight into those genres and to understand what is in these library categories which we have been living in, what's in the idea of geography and what's in the idea of, um, of American literature. So I will just start that running and then we can start the round table. Okay. There we go. I'm sort of fascinated by this. I should put the, unfortunately you can't see the white letters on this screen. We'd have to turn off the lights, but I don't want to take my soporific tones and then encourage you to go to sleep right away. But if you want to come over here and look at this, I'm sort of eager to hear any comments. Thanks. fascinated recently with the idea um, of the difficulties of taking these sorts of data visualizations and applying them to images because there's been so much research on taking text and breaking it into sort of arbitrary categories and coming up with really sophisticated machine learning methods which can help us gain insight into what's in them. And with images, it is there to some degree. It exists in CS as a topic of research, but in the digital humanities, it's only been just sort of just barely touched upon. And it is possible to take images and reduce them into a Cartesian space. It's something I've actually been doing in the last month is just looking at, I mean, you're talking about information complexity. You can calculate the entropy of an image relatively easily and, you know, arrange all of the, all the pictures that you find in a set of advertisements or that come in one of these digital archives that you can build with a mecha and you can place them in, um, you can order them by how complicated they are. But um, I wonder if, if there's actually anything to be gained out of that. I haven't, I haven't yet been able to situate images in Cartesian space. I only know one person who really does that uh, frequently, which is Lev Manovich at um, NYU. He's at NYU, is that right? Um, and I wonder if there's possibility there or if that's sort of a, an area that we are still waiting for somebody to come along. I think part of the problem too is if even if you do something as simple as a Google search with images, you quickly see how it defeat. I mean, you can pretty much find what you're looking for right when you do a word search. But I don't know. Again, this is the technical side, but how they arrive at the algorithms that are going to call up the images, right? The coding that I which right or however that works. If you if it's very specific, like I think in the paper that was uh, at the last session about Mary Surratt. Uh, it's, you know, it's discrete. But a lot of historical images, like the ones you see, are, uh, you know, can vary. And also, I think those tags will vary over time. So, you know, you could one image might mean something at a particular mo historical moment, and then maybe 20 years from now or 50 years ago, we'd have a different set of right keywords that we might attach to that as having priority. I just, I, you know, I just wonder about it, you know, because it seems like so many of even um, the mining that goes on is, as you said, predominantly digital ham humanities text driven. Um, but I, you know, I don't know if I have any more to say about that. Well, I was just going to say, in relation to your talk in particular, I was thinking about, well, you're not going to do your own you're never going to be in a situation where you can do your own metadata for these images and you're depending on all these other databases and catalogs and in many cases images aren't even cataloged if you're talking about you know certain books that have images and you know the images just won't be entered often so you're in a situation where you're not you just you can't find the majority of those images actually so to you know 
do any kind of, it just makes it much more. I, I think there's possibilities out there if you take a genre like the literary annuals from the 1820s and 30s and 40s, we have excellent um, bibliographical um, books, they're dated now, but the information, the data itself is fairly reliable and they'll give you a fair amount of information about who the engraver was, what kind of images were shown. They can't, but this is, we're talking from I, I believe the 1920s or 30s, there's no physical reproduction of the image itself, but now that we, with technology, it's fairly, would be fairly easy to do because each of those annuals typically has maybe a dozen or less uh, engraved images attached to it. So it would be, again, I think something that would open up um, a larger sense. I, I point to the literary annuals because that's happening at the moment, you know, at least in the American context, when literature is sort of emerging, uh, particularly in its nationalist sense. Uh, and many of these, you know, whether you take a uh, sort of a technological perspective and attribute it to changes in the material is used for engraving that's driving this, or if you look at the publishing side, you think about images being sort of either proprietary or in some ways enticing, you know, as a marketing uh, tool for it. But in either case, they're almost always on the side of the stories that we tell about American literary history. They're not central to them. And everything that I've found so far in my research is that they couldn't be more central to the marketing and distribution of literature, in the, particularly in the middle of the 19th century. Uh, and so the, the period that I'm looking at, 1825 to 1875, is trying to sort of get that back, you know, um, less from the margins, more to the center, as it were. And I think that uh, really that my relationship to data visualization was just simply a way to try to make sense of this uh, and try to um, share some of it I could, because this is something I think that the images wind up proliferating in different archives. They're not always assembled in easy ways. You said the catalog, the metadata, just now I learned of a program that where I had been taking all these pictures myself, but now there's a program which I can embed the metadata into the actual image file and then keyword search it, uh, which is a tremendous, you know, tremendous advance from what I'm using right now. Um, and I'm open to any other suggestions either for either programs or, um, or actually collaborators who are working in this area. I'd be welcome to hear it because uh, I'm still learning about this as well. I'm an archivist, um, and with a library degree, and it's interesting to talk about, I, you know, Krista, you made the point of, you know, you're dealing with all of these databases, and those databases are all created by librarians, working with specific guidelines for what, and so it's, it's interesting and important, I guess, to look at what those guidelines are for description. You know, I mean, there's obviously what Ben was talking about, the Library of Congress, or you know, whatever other, you know. Um, but when librarians, when cataloging regular literature, just popular literature, you know, it's just the information that's never, you know, the cover, it's never the illustration. However, when you when you sort of like take, when you go back in time, when things enter this rare category, and you know, rare book school teaches you how to describe paper and, you know, and illustrations. So there's there's all of these like piecemeal pieces of the way and photo cataloging is a completely different set of standards and, and descriptive terms, but they're standard. And so, you know, it just seems like there's an opportunity there if, if you understand the structure in which the librarian was working in in the first place. But I guess, you know, one of the things that, that I was thinking about is when we're talking about where the illustration is and why they're not cataloged. They never work out. I mean, librarians are never taught to catalog a book with like illustration on page 52, but there usually is some notation about that there are 75 illustrations in this particular book. Mm -hmm. And that's a, that's a regular part of book catalog. So, you know, and so it would be pretty, I mean, in my mind, it would be pretty easy, not being a technologist myself, for somebody to be able to say, okay, book, using a script, there are 75 images in this particular book. Find them because there's no there where the gaps in the text are. You know, if it's if it's no Sierra book. Also, I mean, I think that the software is going to develop where, I mean, we can already match pictures on the web, and it's really bad right now. But it's going to get better, and more. 
the more information that is digitized, the richer the results will be. And you know, uh, I think over time, you're going to be able to get richer results from images. So and within like small constrained areas, there's actually a lot of very successful work in that field. Yeah. Uh, there's a, there's, I think he's an independent scholar, but he's been doing very interesting research with Japanese woodblock prints. And I'm blanking on his name. He was at the, um, he, he almost got it too, yeah. <laughs> uh, yeah. Um, but, but woodblock prints are a very sort of constrained vocabulary. So for computers, there are not that many of them, and there are large numbers of exact copies of prints off of the same woodblock or off mm -hmm. of the woodblock that has been modified. And working with you know, lithographs, it's, it's impossible to extract out you know, the conventions that are used in lithographs. And I'm sort of skeptical almost that that would be particularly possible to do that. And, but, there, but there are opportunities for broadening. I mean, if you broaden that algorithm to look at, you know, I mean, so in my last position, I worked at the medical, I worked at the Harvard Medical School, and they did this giant book digitization. And obviously, um, you know, medicine, you, know, you could even look for like a particular view of a bone, and like looking at that bone through time, because there are hundreds of thousands of these books that have been scanned. It just seems like it would be really easy to do that. Well, maybe that's because I'm not a technologist. I mean, do they work? How does the match occur, technically? Like, in other words, when we see an image, we match it in a variety of ways. We can match it either cognitively, we can match it perceptually, visually. I mean, is, is the image search, is the match, is there, do they have the capacity for the right the machine to see, as it were, in that, in that sense of, you know, visual resemblance to pictures may be totally unlike in terms of content, but share a similarity of a shape or a color or any, something like that. And is, is there any way, is that into some of these more, as you were saying, more sophisticated types of image searches, or are they still relying on how it gets read, as it were? So that website that Ben was yeah. talking about is ukio-e.org, uh, which is, you know, Japanese, Japanese. Do you want to put it up well, here for us? Um, yes. Uh, and he has a pretty clear, I think, um, sense of, but on the website, you can read about how the process whereby he accomplishes what he wants. So let's just see. So this is um, what he's done is he has all these wood block prints. And then you can see down here, these are the ones that match up exactly. And these are all in different museums across the world. And they've digitized their prints. And you can see that they're actually Obviously, these are the same wood block that has created all these different prints. But down here, you can see one that is still caught, even though it's black and white, or this one is slightly off in the color, or this one has like other stuff on the side. Um, so, and you can see, like he talks about stuff that he does. So I don't know anything about image processing, but I do know this particular person, and he's actually been working also with uh, the Met in figuring out attributions of prints that in many museums there are prints that are the same but some have an author attribution on the print and others don't so they're able to take those use this exact same thing and figure out what has previously been unknown uh, artists are now being found and that kind of thing so uh, if you're interested in that you should. You can talk to him or look at ukio.org. But it is a genre that's like incredibly tractable, tractable to this sort of analysis. And I don't think that in the next five years there's really any prospect of anything like that for periodicals. Uh, you know, talking about tractable, what makes meteorological weather maps so persuasive? If there's anything that data type integration and uh, reflection in humanist terms, it's the weather map. And I would offer for at least two reasons. One is it's animated retrospectively, and therefore it inbuilts its own prospective information. And the other is that the 
searcher has already done the search. The searcher is interested in what's going to happen where I'm located next. And that such a complicated issue as meteorological data and projection could be so immediate, I think, uh, is a clue to a humanist resolution of what many of these binaries are concerned with, be it, you know, illustration and text uh, or uh, elsewise, the uh, Cartesian and uh, uh, diagrammatic schematic. Although one of the things that's so persuasive about uh, weather maps when is that they are in such an immediately understandable physical form, and we can take up sort of intuitive knowledge of physics to, to just continue the motion, right? Mm -hmm. Like that's what you see, you see this thunder cell coming and you Whoa. know where it's gonna go next, yeah. regardless of the actual prediction. That, right? that, that's, an, uh, that's an issue, but I didn't see you factor in design uh, in, into either of the projections, though it was there. For example, the spectral design, where you have a gradation of cool and warm color, or other types of uh, onlays. And so the design factor is 90% of sub subway maps. In other words, there's some cognitive uh, agenda that the designer is uh, leveraging there to make this real. Yeah, I think that I think that, and this is one of the things that's that's interesting about the ways that we have to figure out how to work with um, with data that comes in. I mean, I am not particularly pleased with the some of the design features in like that last thing that I showed today because like well, you know, we know from <laughs> well but we know from um, you know statistical studies like you shouldn't I have just the HTML color red at the end and you should never put like those raw primary HTML colors you always want to pull out like an HSV space and there are all these sort of strange knowledges about uh -huh. perception uh -huh. as it's embedded yeah, in the human yeah, yeah. perceptual yeah. system which when we do data visualization we have to relearn from the sort of older ways of interacting with mm -hmm. the world and it adds in addition to the sort of you know difficult negotiations between scientific forms of visualization and humanistic forms of visualization a whole aesthetic layer on top of it that, that makes things yeah cognitive uh, yeah. science is particularly uh, cognitive uh, reading comprehension uh, what the mechanisms and neurologies are you know are really a little bit missing in some of this, though you were, bring, you were bringing that out. I think it's interesting, too, to think about, I, I don't know if you've been mulling this over, one of the things I've noticed is that, and this might be one of that split between the humanists that you were talking about or whether, is that the sciences are getting increasingly more comfortable visualizing the data, knowledge itself. So it's not something you, you see it, you don't necessarily read it or even the accesses part of it it's just some this is a right a modeling of it it's something that's taken in all there's an all at onceness almost about the knowledge itself which is something that might strike humanists as being you know who tend to it's not just the uncertainty but the argument the presentation of the evidence all that right that leads up to it the reading part of it perhaps in terms of how we encounter the knowledge you know um, I mean, I think it's it's stunning too. Do you think about when I look at image? If you look at you know the field of visual studies, and you talk about you think about images writ large, 80, 70 to eighty percent of the stuff published on images is published in science journals. It's not published in humanities side stuff. It's all the work's going on over there. When you, if you think about it in just broad in broad terms too, uh, and this includes just all sorts of fields. Um, but I, I wonder if that's part of the equation too. What you're noticing about the reluctance. Right to treat knowledge itself, right, as something to be seen. 
Well, it's partly that scientists are willing to accept data yeah. as yeah. knowledge. They don't, they don't feel the need to interpose yeah. enormous layers of cultural mediation between data and knowledge. And visualizing their data and visualizing their knowledge end up being substantially the same thing a lot of the time. And they do worry about visualizing uncertainty as well, but they mm -hmm. tend to have quantifiable uncertainty, where we tend to have unquantifiable uncertainty, which is not something that lends itself to visualization in any in any persuasive way that so I see. Humanists are supposed to own ambiguity. In mm -hmm. other words, uh, that's something the scientists work, work against. The, where, where you're moving into the 20s, uh, a very humanist phenomena that I, I don't hear mentioned is that uh, photo illustration in mass media connected with its caption enabled the emergence of a persona that was halfway between the text and the picture that is really quite exceptional. For example, on the left of the mayor is uh, the current candidate for the governor. Uh, and suddenly you're given a persona, which is really a, a humanist invention. Neither of them is one or the other. Uh, but it's, there's an ambiguity there as to how they might relate. And that plays out as a, uh, a science paradigm, uh, the, the ambiguity uh, and the actual merge across two media, which I don't think you really cannot discover well in the 19th century because there were no photo persona there. There's the silhouette of Washington. But uh, that is, I would offer, is a, is a trace or evidence that is very different from a photo where you can embed the two. So the ambiguity and the, uh, the sweep of knowledge, I think, are the two keys for bridging between uh, humanist management of uh, these binaries. Any comment in the back? To, or do you want to respond to I mean, this? Not to that exactly, but just the idea of the scientists being more comfortable with data than humanists are. I think there's a difference just in the sense that if you have data on the sciences, it's something often that is recently created. <laughs> it's data that you have helped to create in some way. Or you or other people recently have. Whereas and the humanities, that's often, you know, with, with the mapping of the book trade, for instance, you know, you have this data that is limited because it's what's passed down to you, and there's no way of recreating data in a way that's more complete. You know, there are gaps that you can't do anything with. Um, whereas in the sciences, maybe it's easier to say, you know, we accept that this data is not necessarily uh, we we are willing to commit to this data <laughs> because it's been created. You know, I don't. I have, know. I have, I have roots, but I will tell people. Well, we had this yeah. comment for a while, and then we I know we're running out of time, I, and and uh, I imagine my questions are going to be answered because I had two questions. One, it was I was thinking about this when you were talking, Chris, but it applies to everyone. Like one of the things when you were putting some of the images up, to me, one of the issues about. Um, the data one can get from images or illustrations is that they're so rich in data, right? Like, yeah. I mean, the fact that, as you were saying earlier, like in a photograph, but it's true of paintings too, that one character is next to another character is part of the data, part of your interaction. Like, the, the data is so overwhelming with that. Mm. I don't know how you can extract all that in a way that's comparable to text, which I know is also data filled. What's a figure? Is this a sarcastic remark? Is it? That, that also has a whole right. set of layers of data, but just to me, right? Nelson, image. yeah, Nelson Goodman talks about that in the Oldie yeah. but Goodie book, right? When he the, uh, the languages of art, when he talks about analog versus digital systems, oh. and he compares like a EK, uh, EKG, right, graph, black and white, with a Hokusai, right, drawing, They're both color, black and white images, but it's every difference makes a difference in the analog system, and images tend to can can be that way. So it's how do you register that, right, when you transcribe it. It's the signal noise thing, too. Mm -hmm. I think maybe what the humanists are, it's a little harder maybe to, to tell the signal from the noise in the data that we work with, whereas it becomes maybe perhaps clearer 
when you limit. I mean, one of the things that just in building a clean data sheet to try to upload to some of the open source program, I just have to put things into right neat little boxes and make very discreet right decisions. And this may be part of the larger conversation about what those categories are. But some things you just you know, a notes box, you can't upload the notes box to be visualized, right? You can't, there's no way to do that. It, you know, unless I'm missing, you know, <laughs> uh, a recent development or something, but you know, there's only so much of that that can be, like when, you, when you're talking a large set of data, right? You need something pretty, you know, pretty clean where everything matches up. At least this is what my collaborators at Purdue have been telling me if I want to sort of upload this stuff. But I think it does get to that that problem of right the density of information that you're that an image may possess that doesn't necessarily work that the the representation doesn't work semiotically you know what I'm saying the the generation of the meaning isn't always primarily semiotic there isn't a, a, a representational part of it. it can be contingency adjacency it can be right depth forward all those things add to what the meaning of the image is in addition to just right what it represents I mean, I could sort of just to briefly respond to both of the points. I think that there are ways that, although our images are sort of immensely rich and can be read in all sorts of different ways, it is possible to extract some of those individual yeah. readings. And this is something that we can learn how to do with them and that our technologies enable us to do. I mean, just extremely briefly, in my dissertation, one of the things I talked about uh, was the rise of arrows as a vernacular of advertising, particularly between 1908 and 1913. There's just this enormous proliferation of arrows in American <laughs> uh, periodical advertisements. And Coca-Cola is using them, everybody's using them all over the place, and the advertising industry goes nuts because they're seeing arrows everywhere. And that is a problem which is actually completely tractable by contemporary image extraction tools. There's a lot of literature in the sciences about arrows in particular and isolating and removing them. And had I had more time, I could have done that, but it was just in that area where like, it would have been like a three-day project for something that we don't do. But those are the sorts of things that should be two-hour projects in a year, two years, maybe. So the break is technically started. If you want to continue this conversation, we can. Um, but in 15 minutes, we're going to be moving to the ballroom, which is just in the student center. If you go outside and turn to the right and go upstairs, sort of Taco Bell and Popeyes downstairs in the ballroom upstairs. And we have monitors set up so that you guys can um, demonstrate and display some of your projects. But um, do we have any remaining questions? I just want to make a very quick comment. Um, going back to the issue of density of images, I think a lot of the meaning of the image is actually outside of the image. And I think this is uh, part of the difficulty when uh, you're trying to use to sort of visualize or visualize the visual. Um, because when we catalog things, we remove the context, the material context, and I think we spend a lot of time talking about you know, the marginalia and the context of, uh, in which the, those images circulate, which embed the images with meaning. And then, I'm not sure if it's a provocation, but on the other hand, we are, we're talking sort of about the humanities and the scientists as sort of uh, being sort of on opposite ends. And I would say that in the humanities and literary studies, actually we have a quite a long history of cataloging genres. So I think, in a sense, we have that prehistory that allows us to deal with metadata. We have the lyric, we have sonnets, and so we are very comfortable, in a sense, with these cataloging tools. And I think, again, because visuals circulate very differently, they're performed very differently, um, some of that is really hard to, 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 be, to be recreated through these uh, machine learning. Questions? All right, well, thank you. Thank you very much.